Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Allen. I'm a community producer liaison at the Brooklyn Free Speech TV and Podcast Network as part of Brick Arts Media Brooklyn, which is part of the Downtown Brooklyn Arts Alliance in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> said Brooklyn quite a few times in there, so I couldn't <laughs> get the point. Uh, but yes, uh, my job is to uh, be an advocate for community producers at the um, Media Center of Brick, which is a public access station in Brooklyn that gives people in Brooklyn an opportunity to create their own television shows and podcasts that we broadcast for them um, throughout the borough and five boroughs. And I am your moderator today for a very interesting topic. This is diversity, inclusivity, sustainability, and cultural identity, what role for AI? Now, um, throughout um, today and probably the last year almost, there's been a lot of talk about generative AI. And a lot of that talk is geared around, you know, creativity, um, money, technical issues, and, and as our last panel discussed, a lot of uh, legal and ethical uh, ramifications when it comes to copyrights, when it comes to intellectual property. But um, cultural heritage and cultural aspects of how AI is being affected or affecting things is a topic that doesn't really get discussed much. So I, I hope that we are able to dive into it a little bit today. So this panel will focus on the, ne uh, the necessary interplay between labeling of cultural heritage materials and the creation of data sets for ML AI with a particular view on emerging practices around ethical sharing of cultural heritage. So we have a wonderful panel that we have for you guys today. Um, we're gonna start here on my right. I'm gonna introduce this young lady. Uh, she is the Digital Projects and Services Manager at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, where she works with Metro's digital service teams to extend Metro's uh, repository hosting, metadata, and support services for digital collections and custom digital projects development. Um, please welcome Allison Sherrick. I said, please welcome <laughs> Allison. <Sherrick. laughs> yes. Um, to her right, um, we have a, a gentleman here. He is an award-winning pianist, improviser, and composer, um, electronics experimentalist, and one half of the artistic collective Elekeka. Um, and his name is Gang Chakad. <laughs> Our final panelist today is manages the Open Culture Program, overseeing projects, logistics, and communications that support the Open Culture Community for Creative Commons. Everyone, please welcome Jocelyn Mariah. <laughs> Mayara, Mayara, pardon me. <laughs> yes, so I'd like to break the ice a little bit with each of you. Could, um, starting with you, Allison, just tell me about um, how, and all of you can answer the same question. Tell me about how you inter personally interact with AI um, every day, whether it's uh, professional or personal. Um, so in uh, my work at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, we support the open source development of Archipelago Commons, which is a uh, repository platform. As part of that work, um, for the past several years, we've been uh, in our standard deployment using a natural language processing container. Um, and um, as part of our uh, everyday like workflow pipeline in the repository environments, um, we do uh, post-processing on uh, the uh, HOCR extracted text, uh, VTTs, other kinds of text files uh, to do uh, natural language processing entity extraction and sentiment analysis. We have a separate interface in our deployments for uh, where the, um, the uh, NLP extracted uh, entities are um, you know, we have classes for that, and then that, that information is kept distinct from the human-mediated uh, or human-curated metadata descriptions. And um, in our upcoming phases of work, like uh, moving forward this year and into the next year, we are beginning to use um, image analysis uh, tools as part of a potential uh, internal uh, cataloging and metadata description pipeline for repository environments. And then in my everyday life, I probably use it way more than I realize. <laughs> Uh, gang, same question to you. Yes, I, I was going to um, go ahead with that way as well, that um, 
probably a lot of things that kind of everyday life that I'm kind of unconsciously um, that's kind of powered by AI somehow. But also, I guess in my work, I this is probably a disclaimer. In my own creative work, we haven't really used AI yet. Um, and one of the reasons is we kind of hit the wall, and we can go into that later. But that's maybe that's for it now. Thanks. <laughs> Jocelyn. Sure. So um, we talk about AI a lot in organizing things like this. Um, we are really thinking about how we can convene communities and, and different perspectives around AI in terms of using AI. Um, at work, I'm not doing a lot of it. Um, for fun, I've played around with ChatGPT. I've played around with MidJourney, um, but haven't really incorporated it into, into my day-to-day -day yet. Mm -hmm. And just for transparency, um, I have actively tried to avoid using AI. <laughs> Um, in, my line of <laughs> in my line of business as a, a TV producer, a TV advocate, and a music journalist, um, I've been sort of like trying to avoid using AI, um, particularly um, databases like ChatGBT. But full disclosure, I did use ChatGBT to assist me in naming conventions for a conference that I created and produced for uh, at Brick called the Brick Media Maker Weekend. Um, it helped me to um, sort of brainstorm naming conventions for workshops, as well as um, this year's theme, which is actually about AI. It's called AI Evolution, um, Media Innovation and Disruption. Um, so there we have that. Please don't tell anybody. <laughs> so I'd like to get things started with, um, each, of, each of you can answer this, but I wanted just to talk about um, just the aspect of cultural identity in AI. Jocelyn, I, I'll start with you, because you have an extensive background when it comes to DEI. Um, what are some of the <laughs> issues raised by AI around cultural identity? Sure, happy to speak to that. Um, so I think one of the things that we hope to see on the internet is ourselves and ourselves reflected. Um, and one of the things that's really challenging about algorithms and the way that AI algorithms work is that um, they often play to the average, and so when all of this information gets put in, um, you end up seeing outputs that are often normative, and that leaves out a lot of people. Um, I would say there's also a challenge when it comes to input, so um, all of this information, all of this content that has been created by all of humanity across time already has its own bias biases, so you're putting all of that in, and then you're creating norms, um, and more biases come out. So I think there's a real challenge when it comes to um, this idea of wanting to see yourself reflected in these models where um, they're often really playing to an average and, and end up kind of showing a, a normative um, presence instead of the diversity that we see around the world and, and in ourselves. Yeah, that calls to mind an, um, an issue I, was, uh, I wrote about in an article recently uh, where Capitol Records uh, very briefly uh, gave a record contract to a computer-generated uh, rap artist. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard this story, uh, but last year, um, a computer-generated rap artist uh, called, uh, I think, MM Mecca, uh, or MF Mecca was created, um, and it was swiftly dropped <laughs> um, less than 48 hours later because it was dealing with a lot of um, racist uh, black stereotypes of this uh, sort of racially ambiguous rapper. Um, so the fact that um, non-black uh, computer generators created a racially ambiguous rapper who had all these negative stereotypes, was profusely using the N-word in its raps, that calls to mind what you're saying about the, the, Norman, the normative way of you know, producing AI and sort of leaving out certain cultures in terms of trying to shift and be representative of it. So it's a very good point. And I'd love to add in terms of the sort of cultural heritage sector and inputting all of that information, you know, these wonderful collections that we have around the world are beginning to digitize. And so there's all this wonderful digital material from galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And much of that comes from a colonial context where um, these institutions originated with folks who are traveling the globe and so excited to see these different cultures and then collecting them. And so the way that those items were collected and the way that they're described and showcased um, can also have, have problems. And so when you, you feed all of that into AI, there are some considerations when it comes to sharing. Mm -hmm. Now, 
And another thing when it comes to cultural identity is the ramifications of what AI could mean. And I'll let anyone uh, answer this particular question. Um, I was having a conversation with someone from Microsoft a couple of weeks ago and talking about what are some of the ramifications of AI. And he was saying, yes, a lot of people may lose their jobs when it comes to AI, and then it'll also open up a lot of jobs for people on the back end also. But when you consider that, there'll be a lot of people from um, disenfranchised or underrepresented communities that could lose their jobs in the process and not have the kind of opportunities to get the new jobs that AI will get um, on the back end of that. Um, what do you got? What are you guys' um, remarks or comments about that particular subject? Um, Allison, if you um, have anything to add. Um, relating to that, I think um, it, we, it's, it's come up a, a couple times earlier today, but um, I think because there's a there really is a severe lack of transparency on the, the the public knowledge around the practices and development mechanisms for some of these very popular large uh, AI tools, uh, their data sets, their methodology, um, their internal policies about how they select and potentially deselect materials for inclusion in data sets. Um, and then I, when it related to that, one of the big things that I always think about is how many of these large um, these large uh, tools have been trained on. Uh, data sets that were created using uh, micro work or ghost work for already extremely exploited and marginalized communities um, outside of our Western, like, you know, power systems, um, or outside of, but you know what I mean. Um, <coughs> and how is that going to be compounded again and again if we keep using these tools without understanding how they've been developed, the, the people who put in the work to, to create the, the underlying data sets and um, and what we're what we're going to compound over time again so. mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for you in terms of the artistic aspect of AI could you just um, speak to just some of your views about um, from a, a creative and artistic um, community standpoint of what some of the um, biases and inclusion and discriminations um, can mean for AI right um, I think maybe I could start with um, the work that we do. Like the, um, we we have this project called JIT, and um, we our our project is um, about kind of relearning this tuning system from Southeast Asia that um, maybe kind of lost in time sometime too. And I think when when we start working on that one of the things that we think about is maybe we can use AI to help us find that narrative or, or find that lost voices. But also what we find is first, um, there's no, this kind of data set existed at all in the, um, so we have to kind of start from scratch in order to like be able to know um, all this data set. But also once we looking into that, it's, it's a lot of work for just two of us to work but also it's um, how we are going to approach it. For example, um, this is one thing that I, because I'm trained in Western world, um, one other thing is also, let's say, how are we calling those pitch information names? Are we gonna use Soulfish? Are we gonna use Doremi as, a, as kind of like input? But also what happened in real life as well is, those, some of the node name that were supposed to be called um, has disappeared as well. It's been gone. And it's kind of like one of the thing that we kind of assimilate to Western culture. Um, for example, we don't have our node name anymore. We also in Thai pedagogy, Thai traditional uh, music pedagogy, we also use Do Re Mi, for example. Are we gonna keep using that? Or are we gonna come up with a new way? And who am I, or who are we, that gonna come up with that new name? And should we consult the tradition and how? And just that, there's a lot of, of things just to go dig deeper into that. And I think that's not us, not our, not not just like a few people work. It's kind of like maybe a systematic kind of work that need funding and all that. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for that. That's very, very insightful. Those, for those of you, um, those of you who don't know, uh, Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti Do. That's um, <laughs> all my sound, sound of music head heads over here. <laughs> um, Do Re Mi. That's C D E. You know, on the scale. Um, you know, a part of music theory. You know, Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti C D E F A D. You know, but I'm sorry, I missed a G in there. <laughs> but um. But that, but you're right. That is a very much um, European um, way of, you know, thinking about music theory. When other cultures don't always employ uh, the use of the pentatonic scale or the use of the circle of fifths in the same way um, that people like Mozart and Chopin and Beethoven did, that get transferred uh, in here in the West and have for many years, and that leads to this idea of education and access for the everyday citizen. And um, I'll read this back to you, Jocelyn, um, just in terms of what, how we can, you know, prevent sort of the discrimination and biases via education, uh, because a lot of people are gonna begin to want to use AI on, in everyday lives beyond just using things like chat GBT or using something that they put on YouTube to make Frank Sinatra's voice sing Get Low by Little John and the East Side Boys. <laughs> So tell me about how, you know, how important it is to educate people on the proper way to use um, generative AI to sort of prevent any sort of cultural discrimination surrounding AI. Yeah, it's really tricky. You, you were starting to um, talk about this, this categorization and the way that the Western world categorizes certain things um, and how challenging that can be when it comes to a global perspective, and I think with AI that's what we have, is this sort of, in a very specific slice, um, what's attempting to be a global perspective, but um, not necessarily always achieving that. Um, so I was just reflecting on this, this music notes as a means of categorization, similar to how we categorize things in collections, and how there are these labels that are put on uh, collections items, and just heard this wonderful example from Curationist about a jar that had been, um, I believe it was at the Smithsonian Institute, and um, it was just kind of retreated, and the metadata was retreated because it was this jar that uh, didn't have a whole lot of description. It's called a Jar by Dave, and they were able to go back and figure out that um, this Dave had a full name that they could add to this collection, and it was only labeled slavery, and they put in African-American, and they added more context, added in um, that this person was also a poet because there was some poetry on this vase. Um, so it really got me thinking about how, um, you know, it takes such care and treatment and work to go back into that record and to rethink it and to bring it into a modern context and to, to take care of that. Um, I think the same thing could be done with AI outputs but I think it takes care and work, and I don't think there's one way. I think it's, it's just being aware of um, what that work is coming from and, and what context it has. Um, I think it'll be really tricky. Yeah, context is, uh, is, is very important in, in, in nuance and subtext. It's extremely important in all aspects of life, uh, particularly something as complex as this. So Allison, I'll you know, rephrase the question, same, same for you. Um, how can AI be a tool to amplify efforts for greater diversity, inclusivity, and sustainability? Uh, I think it can be a tool in our wider toolkit that is multidisciplinary and uh, socio-technical. I think it, um, we have the chance to, to uh, remediate, to continue to remediate our, our um, metadata, our descriptions, um, and to uh, do analysis on our legacy collections. We know there's voices missing from the historical record. We know there are perspectives and experiences that are not present in cultural heritage, or not well represented in cultural heritage collections. So I think an area of, of potential benefit for AI tools could be using uh, the analysis capabilities at scale uh, to analyze our collections and identify areas where we need to improve and um, also um, identify uh, potentially like a terminology that, that we can uh, remediate, update, um, make more inclusive. And also I think while we're doing all this at the same time, I think we also have a responsibility to preserve how we did things historically so that we're not wiping away uh, a historical record of wrongs that we did along the way. 
Yeah, one of the key things that you talked about was the multidisciplinary aspect of it. Um, as a 15 year uh, veteran of Brick Arts Media, um, I can tell you that uh, multidisciplinary arts is uh, extremely important in my line of work where uh, we deal with community media, we deal with contemporary art and performance art and, and music in particular. So gang, um, I'm gonna pose this to you. Um, tell me about, from your perspective, in terms of fusing you know, multidisciplinary ways that we can incorporate AI. Um, can AI be used to democratize creativity in art and in a way that empowers a lot of marginalized groups? Um, maybe I can start with um, kind of my own personal experience. Yes, please. Um, like, like we said before, we haven't really used AI yet, but we start to use like um, algorithmic generated music um, in our own project. And in one way that I learned also like because of like we have to go back and um, it's not only like the name note or do re mi, but also like the pitch information itself that are different. And it's kind of like also forced me to go back into all of this and um, kind of like re relearn and unlearn my ear, um, my Western ear. Um, and by doing all of this um, algorithmic work, I slowly kind of like unlearn that and also in the beginning, maybe you you might hear it as it out of tune still, but right now and hopefully in the future, if we have a chance to present this work more, um, this could be normalized in a way that um, you might be, oh, this is just another sound that you you will know and it's fine. It is not out of tune. And I think one of the thing that maybe that could help and another thing that I can think about maybe democratize this, not sure if this relate to AI yet or, or maybe in the future, but also another work that we do, um, another project that we do is called the Gong Ensemble, Jit Gong Ensemble, and Gong Ensemble is this project inspired from an indigenous um, practice you find throughout Southeast Asia where each one of the ensemble have only one gong and they have to kind of play together and kind of listen to each other and in order to create this one ritual music. So we start doing that with, instead of like actual live, uh, actual gong, but we start doing that with live coder and kind of like give them specific pitch to do that. And in a way, I feel like we, we kind of force because you only have one sound. You have to play with me in order to create this music. And we also ask audience to join in with whatever they have in um, their pocket or found object. And in that way, we kind of create this co collaboration between machine and human and kind of like Machine also lose agency. Human also lose agency because none of us could do it just by own. So just your own. So it's kind of like trying to force that um, collaboration to happen. Not sure if it's connect to AI, but hopefully it democratize this agency a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get back to that idea of collaborate collaboration with AI uh, soon. But you did speak to something that I wanted to get to, and I, and I asked each of you all this to chime in. And you talked about um, indigenous art. One of the issues that a lot of people, particularly me, um, have with um, generative AI is the sort of uh, re replacement, you know, the, the fear of it replacing sort of these um, tried and true traditional ways that we create things, particularly when it comes to music and art. Um, which plays a huge part in a lot of these um, underserved communities that you know we're talking about today. Now, in terms of AI, there's a fear that it could commodify or replace outright, you know, the process of creating indigenous uh, work. Um, how do we push back uh, against that and to assure people? And, and, and number one, in an effort to normalize AI in a positive way, and also to uh, reassure the public that uh, these indigenous traditions and the indigenous arts uh, can be enhanced 
um, or moved forward using AI rather than being outright um, outrightly replaced. So um, I'll just plug here. There's a really wonderful set of uh, labels called traditional knowledge labels that are made by local contexts and um, are applied to traditional knowledge works um, in order to advise people on how to share them. So for example, there might be a label that says um, that this is a work that's meant to be seen by women and so that um, an institution can share it in a way that, um, that enables that preference. Um, I think it would be really important to kind of apply that to the way that um, those works might get ingested into AI. Um, but I also just think it's really important in terms of outputs and thinking about um, what might um, be something that seems like an indigenous work of art, but maybe isn't made by an indigenous person and, and being cautious about that. Um, but would love for my um, co-panelists to add more. Allison? Um, I think a, a place to engage would be to actually ask for permission and, and uh, interaction and collaboration and say, do you want to participate in this process? How do you want to participate? What do we need to do differently um, for the indigenous communities? Um, one thing I, I did want to um, talk about related to this topic also is that for some of the language model trainings that we have, some of these large tech corporations that say they have, oh, they have um, uh, multiple language support for certain indigenous languages and things, but internally they're using metrics where they can have a 50% accuracy rate, and then they'll claim that they have multilingual support, but if 50% of the, the communication that you're producing is inaccurate, and maybe that's what's happening to all of you right now as I'm speaking, <laughs> hopefully not, um, can you really claim that you are saving this indigenous language, that you're preserving it, um, or are you commodifying it? Are you, are you mark checking it off your list of saying, oh, we're doing what we should do, we're preserving cultural heritage, we're you know, doing the right thing here. So I think there's, um, I think we need to have consent within the communities that we say that we are representing. Consent is an extremely important thing when it comes to these sort of things, particularly um, as, you know, as me, I'm, you know, as a black man, you know, having consent um, from other communities when it comes to collaboration or incorporation of certain things that are indigenous to people like me who are African American or people that I know who are Caribbean American or, or anything of that nature. That's a huge part of it, particularly when it comes to collaboration. So gang, just ending with you on that particular point. Um, collaboration um, is a particularly important thing for you, not just for you and your, your partner, but also collaboration between yourself and code. Um, so tell me about, um, you know, just end that this one last process uh, before I get to the last question to each of you about um, the importance of um, easing the, the minds of people who, uh, when it comes to trying to get them to collaborate more with, um, with AI rather than to allow it to be a replacement. Right. Um, I, I probably gonna go back to to what, to the, to the practice that I do again. Um, but first of all, the way I collaborate with with the technology right now is, I use it to kind of unlearn my bias fear, in a sense that um, as a point, also as a point of inspiration as well. That oh, um, maybe there's a, another way we can do this, or there's maybe another way we can hear this. But also, um, I also look at, l for example, back to Gong Ensemble again, kind of as a w an example, not only co collaboration between um, human, but also maybe collabor collaboration between human and machine, that um, maybe there's another way we can look at this collaboration. Maybe it has to be um, more interlock, more interplay, more in the inter, what's the word? Interdependent, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's kind of like where we are at right now and wanna see what's gonna bring next. Thank you. I have one last question I'll ask each of you. Um, starting with you, Jocelyn. Um, what guidance would you personally give 
to offer, or sorry, what guidance would you personally offer to ensure generative AI is something that's ethical? I mean, that's a big question, um, but I, <laughs> I think one piece of advice I would give is, um, you know, what problem are you trying to solve, and did what you just do actually solve that problem? So I was thinking a little bit about um, this Levi's ad campaign where um, Levi's decided to, instead of hiring a diverse set of models, use generative AI to create images of a diverse set of models. Well, you know, that created a diverse looking ad campaign, but you missed out on hiring a bunch of diverse models and actually paying people who, um, you know, could probably use the money. And so I think um, it's important to think about the impact of the use of your, your um, AI as well as um, the output. Gang. In terms of ethic, uh, I think it there's a lot more, especially come with the the cultural um, heritage. I think there's there's a lot more research and resources um, finding that we need to um, maybe working on that and think about as let's say input. Just just focus on the pitch information that's already like. Um, there's a lack of that information and I think um, maybe we could start with um, putting more resources into finding data set that are more um, true to itself and um, ethical in a way, I guess, yeah. Allison. Um, I think uh, starting from the, the framework of uh, AI as a tool, not as a solution, is always a good place because I feel like there's a lot of emphasis and hype right now on like AI as the solution to all the problems and everything will be golden and magical. Like, um, but I think there's no hand waving in certain situations, and I think we're going to still have to keep doing our uh, cross disciplinary work uh, to um, to be good stewards of cultural heritage and the historical record. Um, in terms of more like a nuts and bolts practical things, I think that we need to uh, keep pressing for more transparency from big tech companies. I think we're making some very like broad strokes, educated guesses on their toolings under the hood, but I think it's time for us to be like, no, really, we need to better understand um, where your, your training materials are sourced from. Um, if we want to keep using the, the outputs that, that these big tech companies are creating, um, and I think uh, we need to have uh, more um, uh, collaboration uh, where we draw from like our cross-disciplinary expertise to make sure that we're not coming from just a technical perspective or just a uh, internally focused uh, perspective, but that we keep uh, trying to, to widen the voices that we're listening to. Thank you very, very much. Very eloquent. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank all of you um, for participating in this. Before I open it up to questions, I just want to get a quick show of hands. Um, how many of you, um, before coming uh, to this event, how many of you guys, uh, just by show of hands, how many of you were optimistic about uh, AI and the direction it's going? Show of hands, this is a safe space. Okay, a little more, more than half of you. So how many of you here feel like even uh, before you got here that AI is a bad idea and that it's going to lead us to um, bad places. Show of hands, safe space. Okay, yeah, and someone in the back is, yeah, right, right. yeah. How many of you are going to watch uh, The Terminator and The Matrix much differently <laughs> knowing you know, what we know now about AI? <laughs> Um, I'd like to open it for questions. If anybody has any questions, um, we have someone that's gonna be coming out of you, sir, in the front. Hi. Um, I found it really interesting that the thematic underpinning of a lot of what uh, you all were talking about was this kind of, like a pursuit of detaching uh, the framing of AI from a more technocratic orthodoxy. Like, I've, I've been reading a lot about reframing AI as uh, instead of a model as applied practice, or instead of just privacy, contextual privacy. And I think it's fair to say that non-technical communities, particularly creative ones, uh, have more capacity by the nature of their work to introduce a more diverse terminology uh, in this type of space. 
So my question is, how do you leverage a diverse lexicon when it comes to this kind of thing uh, in public education, as you mentioned, but also in retaliation against a lot of the risks that you were also describing in your lines of work? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, framing AI in, in a non-technocratic way because right now it feels very, uh, sometimes even like just the terminology that we're all using, it feels like we're, it's not settled, it's like shifting ground and we're all trying to, de to describe it and like what, the, what it really means. Um, and I think there's a lot of, uh, room in the cultural heritage space, in the library archives museum space to define, define things on our terms um, and in, in ways that are respective of the communities that we're supposed to be representing. Um, and then also uh, doing education for ourselves, for our, our patrons, our users, our researchers, and then kind of managing understanding and expectation as tools are developed and go along rather than just sitting back and saying, oh, this is how, this is uh, AI and we're gonna end up with like Hal from 2001 Space Odyssey, which is what I watched before I came here. Open, open <laughs> the pod doors, Hal. Yeah. Open the pod doors. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, yes, you in the front. Thanks, um, so when I think about, um, I guess basically diversity and inclusion, especially when it comes to AI and language models, I think inclusion into what? We've already kind of talked about some of the issues around classification and how like things have been kind of interpreted, or a lot of large language models have been trained and built through a Western lens. There's um, an example, um, it was a Medium article called The Myth of the American Smile, about how if you ask for a photo of a group of people across different cultures who maybe historically wouldn't have you know, smiled in photos, you get <laughs> the same American smile across everything. So I guess um, the question I wanted to ask, and I'm trying to frame it properly, but um, what would you want to, like what's a, maybe a question you ask yourself or a practice you do or something you'd like to see done differently in the future to ensure, um, I think, genuine um, cultural nuance and expression um, with AI? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I think one of the things that's really important, and I hope this is happening, but that um, in organizations or companies that are creating AI models that there is a diversity in hiring and that the people that are creating these models come from diverse perspectives. Um, Yasin earlier gave a great example of teaching these students about things on the internet and talking about how the boys were per perfectly comfortable with sharing everything openly and the girls were a little bit more hesitant. And you know, I think that's because um, girls from an early age have an experience of the male gaze and being protective of that and um, and how that experience uh, relates to a different kind of sharing online. And so um, I think it's really important that tech companies really focus on getting that diverse um, perspective in their coding rooms. Thank you. I would just say uh, related to that, um, I think it's interesting the number of um, I guess you would call them like AI, um, I'm searching for the word, but like something like the Algorithmic Justice League. Um, a lot of these companies that are like AI oversight or ethical analysis uh, groups, working groups are usually founded by uh, diverse persons who were fired from the big tech companies <laughs> <laughs> for uh, asking hard questions and being whistleblowers. So I think we know it's a problem. Um, so maybe listening to, to their perspective, what they're flagging as like problematic and what they're seeing is a good place to start. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I, I'd like to just personally end on this note, um, just from a, a personal standpoint. Yeah, it, AI does sort of scare me just because of the way the trajectory of progress has happened in my lifetime. Um, one of the things that I notice, particularly as a person that's involved in documenting the entertainment and art and cultural business, that convenience reigns supreme almost all the time, um, which is, makes AI very worrisome for me. You know, um, 
once again, show of hands, if any, I, everybody talked about, in the last panel, they talked about, uh, there's a gentleman that talked about the fact that, you know, you still need a human being to initiate the AI to do its thing. And I keep thinking, it's only gonna take one person to create um, generative AI that doesn't need a person to initiate it, which could, which like I said, <laughs> progress and convenience will always reign supreme. And all it takes is one person to make that innovation and then we have that and then we're in real trouble. But the important thing to understand is number one, the educational aspect of AI. I think that conferences like this and these sort of conversations help us to understand that AI is ultimately should be used as an auxiliary, in my opinion, you know, an assist rather than something that's going to take over um, and just make us all lazy, for lack of a better term, which I learned in the conference yesterday that that's kind of a misnomer. So I just encourage every one of you to take something from these panel discussions and these sort of opportunities to get as much education as you can and then pass it on to the people who you feel uh, would best need it because that's ultimately going to always be the leveling the playing field is, um, is educating people, which is a huge important part when it comes to cultural identity is an even playing field for education for all communities. Thank you guys so much, very much.